very good evening i am i welcome you to the third lecture under rapid revision series under this series in this lecture i have picked up the topic that is unemployment in india challenges and policy options as i mentioned in the last class also that in this series i am picking up the topics which are directly impacting the inclusive growth process of the country and in this series we have discussed the poverty inequality food security and now we are taking up the topic on employment in india because the inclusive growth as we defined is the broad based growth pro poor growth and the growth which is resulting into equitable share of the benefits of the growth the benefits of the growth will be equitably shared by all if everyone gets the employment or job in accordance with his skills and capabilities then the the person concerned will be contributing to the growth process in accordance with his skills and capabilities and in return he or she will be getting the reward in the form of uh, salary or wages which will help him to maintain a decent living standards and this is how we try to achieve the inclusive growth in a country and therefore in this process the unemployment or employment status of the working population uh, plays a very important role and that's why uh, this topic we have picked up to give you some idea about how the employment status in a, in india particularly is is leading to inclusiveness in the growth process this topic is again a very important Uh, as it is, uh, it is one of the integral component of the Sustainable Development Goals, which have been approved by uh, the, the 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 Climate Change Summit. Um, all the uh, countries they have approved the SDGs, and targets are set for 2030. And SDG number eight is is particularly related to promoting the inclusive and sustainable economic growth. which will lead to full and productive employment and decent work for all this is the ltg number 8 and if it is achieved obviously it will uh, add to the process of achieving the inclusive growth in a country if you look at the sub targets set under the ltg number 8 the the important uh, the sub target is that we have to encourage the the business organizations or entrepreneurs for creation of the job we also have to protect the rights of the labor and also promote safe and secure working environment for the workers we also have to ensure that the development oriented policies need to be promoted that support productive activities and the job creation the most important sub target which is kept under this ldg number 8 is by 2030 we have to reduce substantially the proportion of youth who is not in employment education or training this is very very important uh, sub target of this ldg number 8 we have to reduce the number of youth who are neither in the employment nor in education nor anywhere in the training it means they are not participating in the labor market for seeking the job and the proportion of such youth is increasing over a period of time in most of the emerging countries including india this aspect i will highlight specifically when we we'll move further in this topic and therefore the topic uh, we have selected is directly influencing the inclusiveness of the growth process and this is we have to keep in mind always the data which is put forward by the undp which also uh, make it important that this topic is to be discussed as far as the the world economic and social development is concerned they have given some data 
which say that 170 million people worldwide were estimated to be unemployed, as were estimated to be unemployed in 2018. And this is around, the unemployment rate turns out to be around 5%. 5%. And they said that by 2020, the, the, it will increase to 175 million. It means every year, 1 million people will be added to the unemployment uh, unemployed force of the country, of the world. And therefore, they said that the participation rate of the, the, the women and the male also need to be improved because they are uh, significantly low. And they also said that the large proportion of the people who are employed, they are employed in the informal sector. Informal sector, it, it means around 60% of the world working force is employed in the informal sector. An informal sector need to be converted into formal sector by giving them the better work environment, better wages or better social, social security status to the people. And that's why this whole gamut of issues which are related to the topic becomes the become the part of the syllabus. This topic is is especially important for the India's economy because we are having at the moment the demographic dividend. Demographic dividend means that the 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 proportion of the population in the working age group is more than the proportion of the population is not working. It means working population size is more than the non-working uh, <coughs> share of the population. And meaning thereby that the people who are earning are more than the non-earning people. And that's why we have an advantage at uh, our disposal in the form of these, the, the around 60 to 63 percent of the population in the age group of 15 to 59 which is considered to be the working age population in our country. And this is rising. It is not static. This is rising over a period of time. And many people have estimated that we shall be reaching at the peak around 2040. Some people have said 2036. Some people say 2044. Depending upon the various assumptions they have made. And therefore, the peak is likely to reach somewhere sometime in the 40s. And therefore, this advantage is not available with us permanently. And therefore, as long as this advantage is available with us in the form of the, the, the productive population is more than the unproductive population, we should take advantage of it. If we can fully utilize the productive population of the country, we can enhance the rate of growth at least by 15% point. 15% the rate of growth can be increased without doing anything else except using the 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 youth population productively. And that's why this this uh, this uh, exploitation of this advantage is is very very important for us. But the question is that the the, the dividend which we have it has attained the the trend. Uh, which basically uh, leads to asymmetric information because the demographic dividend is largely available in those states, in those states which are growing at a slower rate, or those states which are already having the huge population. Therefore, the the for example, in the hinterland state like the Madhya Pradesh, Rajasthan, UP, Bihar, Jharkhand, Chhattisgarh, these are the states where the the youth population is rising but at the same time these states are not generating adequate employment for the rising youth population while on the other hand we have a uh, states where the the population is almost uh, uh, stabilized and therefore population is not rising and youth people population is, is almost stable therefore we have to we have to have a asymmetric demographic trends and we have to take this into account while making any policy relating to the employment generation. The second is we have to create the gainful employment opportunities for this youth. And gainful employment opportunities can be created 
only when only when the 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 people which are seeking employment have the adequate skills if they do not have the adequate skills then obviously the employment opportunities created by the development process may not be suitable for them and they may remain unemployed therefore the the the, the crux of the point is that not only we have to generate the employment opportunities on the one hand but on the other hand we have to uh, we, have, we have to ensure that the persons who are seeking the job in the labor market they also possess the requisite skills which are required in the market unless we match the two that is the requirement of the, uh, the skills in the job and the skills possessed by the uh, people who are seeking jobs unless these two things are matched it is very difficult to generate the adequate employment opportunities for those who are seeking the jobs in the labor market and this mismatch always leads to it always creates the unemployment situation in the country and therefore to 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 understand the the nuances of the employment market in india we need to understand some technical terms which are being uh, used uh, in service and therefore based on, and sometimes the question directly comes on these technical terms for example the the terms which we are uh, including here are those as defined by the erstwhile national sample survey organization which has now become a part of the CSO which itself is called the National Statistical Office and in this in various surveys conducted by the by the government through NSSO they define certain terms and the first important term they define is activity status active activity status refer to the activity situation in which the individual is found during the reference period with respect to his participation in the economic or non economic activities and therefore depends of depending upon the activity status we can define the the three categories of the workforce that is the the those um, uh, but that that part of the working population which is already engaged in some economic activity and they are already working they are already employed and that is called the working force that is called the working force apart from the working force in the labor market we also have the labor force which is not working at the present but seeking job for the uh, seeking job in the market and they are the unemployed people they are the unemployed people and third category is that they are neither seeking job nor available for work it means they are the people who want to be voluntarily unemployed and this is the this is the this is called the natural unemployment in the economy these people will never uh, lead to the zero unemployment situation because every economy has some fraction of the working population which is neither seeking job nor available for work and they want to be unemployed voluntarily they have to be excluded from the uh, definition of the <coughs> the labor force and therefore these three activity status are first defined and then we define the labor force and the <coughs> working force labor force includes all the people who are presently employed or are seeking job in the labor market therefore all those workforce which is available in the labor market either they are employed or seeking the job is a part of the labor force it means we are excluding those persons who remain to be voluntarily unemployed that is third category that we have excluded after excluding them whosoever uh, is there in the labor, labor market is defined as a labor force work force is 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 that part of the labor force which is already employed which is already employed and therefore given the definition of the labor force and work force we define the unemployment rate we define the unemployment rate unemployment rate is always defined uh, in the in the following way the labor force minus work force divided by the total labor force into 100 in percentage for uh, terms therefore the, the 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 percentage of people 
who are seeking job in the market um, is is in fact defined as unemployed people and percentage of people who are seeking job uh, is considered to be unemployed people and technically we define the labor force minus workforce divided by the total labor force into 100 that is the the rate of unemployment when we say 2% is the rate of unemployment it means only 2% of the labor force is actually seeking job in the market and the remaining are already employed and the third term we are using is work participation rate work participation rate is estimated to be the percentage of the total workers to the total working population and this is the the the, the total working population who is already working that is called work participation rate work participation rate and work population ratio is yeah, how many persons are employed per thousand population or per thousand persons so normally the last one is 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 never used in this process but the first four terms labor force workforce unemployment rate and the work participation rate these are the terms which are frequently used in the topic when we discuss the issue relating to unemployment now <clears throat> The how do you measure that uh, the extent of unemployment in a country in India, as I said that we are using the definition which have already been developed by NSSO in the past in the in their surveys, the definition they are using, we are using the same definition even today. And therefore, the the, the definition given by the NSSO are briefly mentioned below. That is they define first the usual status approach for example you are a, a carpenter and therefore if you are not getting the uh, the job of carpentry in major part of the year 365 days suppose you are not getting the job for four months five months six months uh, for for the for the job for which you are possessing these skills you are considered to be unemployed in the economy as per your usual status, as per your usual status, sometimes people uh, don't get the job in the area in which they possess these skills. Therefore, they, are, they engage themselves in some subsidiary jobs. For example, carpenter may engage himself in some painting job or in some whitewash kind of job. So therefore, that is a subsidiary job he is doing. So therefore, sometimes we, we, we calculate the total employment um, of a person both in the usual status plus subsidy status jobs and therefore the the this is the this is the definition which gives you the open unemployment in the economy means that if for major part of the year people are not getting the jobs in their usual status or even in the subsidy status then it is said to be the unemployment this is said to be unemployed openly in the market openly in the market this is called open unemployment open unemployment in the economy the weekly status is defined when the when the in the reference period the surveyor asked the person how was you placed in the previous week that is in the previous week whether you were employed or you remain unemployed and here the definition is if somebody is getting some gainful work even for one hour in the previous week he is considered to be employed as per the weekly status this is a very uh, very very uh, uh, it's a surprising definition but this is it is there even if you are employed gainfully for one hour in the previous week you are ticked as a uh, employed person under weekly status under weekly status and therefore the weekly status is is defined uh, in the, for finding out uh, weekly how many persons remain unemployed then we come to the daily status approach in the daily status approach we ask the person how you are placed today and that is on the date of the survey are you have you got some job today or are you still seeking the job uh, for the day if the person gets at least four hours job at least four hours job in a day then we uh, call it the half day 
employed. If you get the job uh, between four to eight hours, we call it a fully employed uh, person for a day. And therefore, the if he gets the job for four hours or more, he is considered to be employed on daily status approach. And therefore, using these three, uh, the activity status, that is usual status, the weekly status and daily status, the unemployment is measured by the uh, NSSO in their surveys. And you, using these concepts, you, you see that how the, the, the unemployment trends is, is visible in our country. Using these three, of course, definitions are vague, but these are the definitions which are being used in, uh, in finding out the magnitude of unemployment in the economy. But before we go to the trends, the most important area which you need to understand is the availability of data relating to employment and unemployment uh, status of the people in the country. This is very, very important because the way, the, 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 the point you change the source of data, your conclusion may change. Your conclusion regarding employment may change. And that's why in this topic, the most important thing is source of the data which we are using. And I, in this table, I have indicated the various sources through which the data is collected is, is being collected relate, relating to employment or unemployment status of the people in the country. And the, the most credible or reliable source uh, through which we get the employment, unemployment data is the National Sample Survey Organization. As I said, the NSSO is, is the old name, now it is merged with the CSO and therefore we may call it a, is a, is a, is a CSO survey or NSO survey, National Statistical Office survey. So NSSO is the term which I used earlier and NSSO is conducting the regular survey from 70 to 73 onwards and therefore and they are conducting the survey on quinquennial basis. That is, every four years, every four years gap, they are conducting the survey of employment or unemployment status of the people in the country. And therefore, the data is available to uh, us um, from the NSSO survey after every four years. So, data is available after every four years. Uh, <coughs> Uh, from the NSS to data from 72, 73 onwards. So 1972, 73 onwards till 2011-12. The, we have a consistent data of the employment or unemployment status of the people using the same methodology. Using the same methodology. It means that nine, from 1972-73 till 2011-12, we have a consistent data series which will give you the trends in the employment or unemployment in the country. And this is the, the most credible and reliable uh, uh, data we have as far as the, the unemployment is concerned. Because the NSSO conducts the survey only after four years and we need the data uh, more frequently. Therefore, the, the Ministry of Labor and Employment, the Labor Bureau of the Ministry of Labor and Employment they conduct a similar survey, similar survey they conduct on annual basis, on annual basis, but this survey is being conducted only after 11-12. Prior to that, this survey is not available. And last survey conducted on this uh, basis was 2015-16. Therefore, in 2015-16, we have a data from Labor Bureau uh, about the employment and unemployment status but using the same methodology as adopted by the NSSO. Only sample size is slightly different, but the methodology is the same. It means till 2015-16, we have a consistent series of data which will give you the trends, trends in the employment or unemployment in the country. And we have a long uh, uh, time series data from which we can draw various conclusions. The third source or third source of data which is collected is the, the, the Labor Bureau's quarterly report on changes in the employment in the selected sectors. <clears throat> the, in, the, in this quarterly report, 
the NSS of selected certain export oriented and labor intensive sectors and in, <clears throat> in these sectors they uh, they measure the employment generated on quarterly basis on quarterly basis and around eight sectors have been selected under this category and these are export oriented or the the labor intensive sectors and if in these sectors if if employment is rising we may say that overall employment will be rising in the economy if in these sectors employment is not rising we cannot make with confidence that overall employment is rising in the economy and therefore we have a quarterly data on the employment generation in the selected export oriented and labor intensive sectors this data we have this the third report which is published by the labor bureau is quarterly report on employment and here the the, the labor bureau uh, collect the data from establishment wise and in the non farm sectors the non agricultural sectors they picked up uh, certain enterprises employing more than 10 workers and in these uh, entrepreneurs in these enterprises we find out we, we whether the employment has increased or decreased during the reference period and therefore we have a the four set of data available with us but the data is not comparable that's why we have to use this data very very uh, carefully the other two sources which provide the data for employment or unemployment are one is epfo that is the employees provident fund organization the employees provident fund organization registers the 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 the, the people who got the jobs um, um, recently and they are registered by the employer in the epfo for for provident uh, fund purpose that's why uh, people some some people they use the epfo data to make a comment on the employment generation in the country if more and more people are registered in the epfo one may conceive that employment is rising in the economy but it may sometime lead to the uh, the, the the conclusion which are not correct and misleading conclusion can be drawn based on the epfo data therefore the data is not generally used in in making the the comments and observations on employment generation in the country therefore the the other source which is very reliable but the source is 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 private not the government that is center for monitoring india's economy this is the private organization but generates very frequent data monthly data they generate on open unemployment every month they publish the figure indicated indicating the percentage on employment both in the rural areas urban areas among the male among the female among the total they publish this data every month this is the most reliable data and government is also using this data in responding to some of the parliament questions and also in preparing the reports on the employment therefore cmie data is also used sometimes in making the observations on employment and unemployment but the the data published by cmie is generally not comparable not comparable with the nsso data because of the difference in the methodology or difference in the sample selection etc therefore we cannot club the two uh, data together and draw the uh, conclusion therefore we have to draw the conclusion based on a uh, a one type of data uh, for the uh, time period and if the that particular data is not available only then we go for the alternative source to uh, to support your argument regarding the employment generation so therefore the data source in this topic is very very important because we the data is flowing to you from various sources data is flowing from various sources now if you just use the nsso data as i said nss has started uh, conducting the employment unemployment status survey from 1972 73 onwards and we have a time series data using the same methodology same methodology and we have a usual 
uh, status approach uh, according to which what is the rate of unemployment and according to weekly status what is the rate of unemployment and according to daily status what is the rate of unemployment the data presented in the table indicates uh, indicates clearly the rate of unemployment you see that as per the usual status the rate of unemployment is of 1.6 percent after uh, increasing to 4 percent it has stabilized around 2.7 percent by 11 12. for weekly status obviously the the rate of unemployment will be higher and it is around 3.5 3.6 percent in the last few years and the current status is the five to six percent is the rate of unemployment so this is the rate of employment which we uh, include which we uh, have based on the the definition given by the nsso in estimating the magnitude of unemployment as we have said that the, uh, some people are saying that the data may not be reflecting the true status of unemployment or employment in the country why they are saying uh, that because the in the in the in the economy like ours people cannot afford to remain unemployed people cannot afford to remain unemployed if they are not getting the job in their usual status they change the status and and get the job in some other areas because the survival is the is the major issue and for surviving they need an employment therefore sometimes people uh, uh, make some criticism about the uh, the rate of unemployment as reflected in the nso survey but without going into the critical criticality we assume that these are the rate of unemployment as reflected in the nso survey and therefore 11 12 this usual status rate of unemployment was 2.7 percent which was not very high and current weekly status 3.4 percent and daily status 5.6 percent it was not very high rate of unemployment and we have a various kind of unemployment here but here we are measuring the open unemployment only open unemployment as per the principal status weekly status and the daily status but we have various kind of unemployment these unemployment are measured depending upon the purpose for which data is being collected for which data is being collected separately but the nsso give you the status of unemployment uh, that is the open unemployment in the economy over a period of time under these three definitions. And therefore, we we started using these definitions to comment upon the 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 employment or unemployment status in the country. But if you if you look at the situation that even if you look at the prior to the the economic reform that is 93-94 is the period when we uh, initiated the economic reform. And prior to that, we have a centrally planned economy, and thereafter also uh, we have a new economic reforms and new economic policies implemented. You see that no matter whether you are in the phase of central planned economy model or you are in the phase of the economic reform model, unemployment is still prevails. Unemployment, as per the NSSO data, is prevailing. Is prevailing almost at the same rate as it was in the in the in the prior to economic reforms therefore the problem of unemployment remains a a perennial problem for the country for the last seven to eight decades the problem is persisting problem is persisting unemployment problem is persisting and therefore the no matter which policy framework you are either you are in the central plan development framework or you are in the modern framework wherein we have introduced the economic reform where we have made our economy which is uh, governed by the market forces the status of unemployment has not changed much it means neither of the two policies have been able to have a dent on the unemployment uh, situation in the country and therefore we to understand why it is happened we need to understand the structural issues relating to India's economy and that is very important to understand that will make you uh, to understand the problem of unemployment in the country. You see that we have taken the, the period 1994 till 1516 and this is all uh, the 
the data is NSS to data and we are just concentrating on the phase of economic reforms. In the economic reforms phase, how far the, 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 the unemployment situation has been tackled and how the, the market is behaving, labor market is behaving uh, after the new economic policy was introduced. You see that the, uh, in the, in the, if you look at the table, you find that agriculture, in agriculture, which is the largest employer of the working force in India is that they are employing 241. First, you look at this total uh, labor force available. 381 is the total workforce available in 1994. 1999, 2000, it 408 million, 469 million, 484 million, and then the 485 million. This is the total labor force uh, available. And you see that in the last year, the, the, the labor force is almost stagnant. Labor force has become stagnant. Out of this total labor force, around 64% was employed in the agriculture itself. Right? 240, 1.5 million people were employed in agriculture in 93-94. That is around 64.6% uh, of the population was employed in agriculture, which gradually declined to 61.7 or 58.5 and it reaches to around 47 and 15, 16. But you see, if you look at the absolute change in the workforce in agriculture, you find that it is increasing till 2004, 5, 241, 246 and 268. Till 2004, 5, the people engaged in agriculture were rising. It was only after 2004-5, it started declining in agriculture. Absolute number employed in agriculture started declining. And once they are started declining, agriculture is releasing some workforce, which are to be absorbed in the other non-agriculture sectors. If you look at the manufacturing, manufacturing, you see that the, the 39 million, 43 million, I'm just rounding out the figure, and 54 million. And after reaching the 59 million in 11-12, the, the people employed in, in manufacturing started declining. And in 15-16, they have declined almost 10 million people absolutely declined in the manufacturing sector. And therefore, the people released by the agriculture are absorbed largely in the services sector from 77.7 million. It consistently rising and it reaches to 141 million in services. And in non-manufacturing sector also, it was consistently rising from 15, 16 million in 93-94 to 57 million in the 15-16. Uh, Therefore, the, the, the labor released by the agriculture is not absorbed by the manufacturing sector. Rather, it is absorbed in the non-manufacturing and services sector in non-manufacturing and services sector. The other important point which need to be noticed uh, from this table is that the workforce, which was consistently rising from 374 uh, in 1994, and it, it, it increased to 474 in 11-12. But thereafter, it started declining. Workforce itself is declining. It means number of people employed has declined, has declined. This is a very, very important trend which is emerged after 11-12. And the other important trend which is emerged from this table is that after 1994, the, in 1999-2000, uh, we were having the 361 million people in the informal sector, in the informal sector, which has increased till 11-12 to 438 million. It means from 90% of the workforce which were employed in the informal sector has increased to 92.6% in 11-12. It means those who are released by the agriculture over a period of time, they are largely absorbed in the non-manufacturing and service sector in the informal sector. Informal non-manufacturing non and informal services sector, they are absorbed. And therefore, the, the size of informal sector is rising. 
informal sector is a sector where the people are employed but no social security is ensured maybe not minimum wages are offered no the 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 written appointment letter is given no contract is signed they are just employed at the market wage rate and no security is ensured to them no and any other benefit except the wage rate is given to them this is the informal sector and therefore the the labor released by the agriculture is largely absorbed in the informal non manufacturing and informal services sector and therefore the problem in india is is basically not the 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 magnitude of the unemployment but the problem is the quality of the employment because as i said in the in india being a uh, relatively poor people they cannot afford to be unemployed because they have to earn for their survival and therefore um, if they are not getting the job according to their skills and capabilities they are uh, absorbed in the informal sector informal sector and and informal sector is a low paid sector normally it is characterized as without any social security without any other benefits and therefore the informal employment has risen that's why we are having a very low level of unemployment in india you see that even after 1994 94 the level of uh, unemployment usual status remain around 2.5 to 2.7 on average why it is is it is considered to be very low and acceptable normal but why it is low in india because the people are said to be absorbed in the informal sector and they are considered to be employed by the survey and that's why the level of unemployment a level of employment in the country is is very high and level of unemployment seems to be very low because of the rising informal sector in india and this is a very very important trend which has emerged in india which has emerged in india this is first important conclusion uh, of this uh, data analysis is that of course the unemployment is persisting but the magnitude of the, of the unemployment is not so high why it is not so high because the people who are leaving the agriculture and search for the job they are largely absorbed in the informal sector informal non manufacturing or informal services sector they are absorbed in this sector and therefore the level of unemployment appears to be very very low but if you really want to see that during this period 7273 till 2015-16 whether the growth process has any impact on the employment generation or on the unemployment status of the people in the country meaning thereby that we have been increase we have been growing on average at the rate of 6 to 7% whether this 6 to 7% rate of growth has any impact on the employment generation and to understand this uh, the the relationship between growth and employment we have uh, put forward a data from the nsso survey from 70 to 73 till 11 12 and you see that in the quin canyon survey that is the four year survey we have uh, we have conducted and in this four year survey we have calculated the rate of growth of employment in this period and in the same period uh, the the we have also calculated rate of growth of gdp rate of growth of gdp and in the last column we have calculated the employment elasticity with respect to gdp that is the this 2.61 divided by 4.6 multiplied by 100 that is the employment elasticity or infraction if you don't multiply by 100 it will be infractions therefore for each survey corresponding to rate of growth of employment we uh, we try to calculate the employment elasticity with respect to growth with respect to gdp and we find that this in last column is really very very important you see that after particularly the 93 94 the rate of growth has picked up very fast rate of growth has picked up very fast and prior to the 80s and 90s rate of growth has been slower but it, the economy was growing 
in the in the in the first uh, quinquennial survey the the elasticity was 0.57 it means if the rate of growth rises by 1 percentage point the employment will rise by 0.57 percentage point 0.57 percentage point it means the half of the gdp is resulting into creation of the jobs and therefore the 0.57 is elasticity similarly in the next survey it was 0.56 and it, you see that the trend is declining. Trend is continuously declining. This is declining trend. And why the GDP is in increasing trend? GDP is on the increasing trend. It means even if GDP is rising over a period of time, the employment is falling. You see this in this step, in this uh, column. Rate of growth of employment is consistently falling over a period of time. And particularly, if you look at the, the economic reform period, economic reform period, the fall in the employment is very steep. Fall in the employment is very steep, despite the fact that the rate of growth of uh, GDP has been very high, resulting into the falling elasticity, uh, employment elasticity with respect to GDP. And in last uh, gap, in the last survey, 2004, 5 to 11, 12, the employment elasticity is only 0 0.02. It means if GDP rises by one percentage point, the employment will rise only by 0 0.02 percentage points. It means the growth is taking place, but growth is taking place without commensurate employment growth. Without commensurate employment growth. It means that even if growth is taking place, it is not generating adequate employment opportunities adequate employment opportunities and this figure 0 0.02 is further reduced to 0 0.01 in 2015 16 and 2015 16 is the survey conducted by ministry of labor using the same methodology it means the employment rate is falling over a period of time and this is also substantiated by the other reports if you look at the ministry of labor uh, employment and employment status report of eight employment intensive sectors which I mentioned this is quarterly report. And eight sectors are textile, leather, metals, automobile, gems, transport, IT, BPO, and the handloom and power loom. These are the sectors which are labor intensive as well as export oriented. And you see in this, in this, in this, in these eight sectors, in 2011, 9.3 lakh jobs were created. And in 2015, only 1.35 lakh jobs are created only 1.35 lakhs jobs are created. It means in these labor intensive sectors, the job created has fallen. If in these sectors job is not rising, we cannot expect that job will rise in the other sectors. And this is the situation which we are uh, having. And therefore, the, the situation we are facing today is, despite the fact that the GDP is rising, but commensurate to that, the employment is not rising. Employment is is not rising. And therefore, Ministry of Labor and Employment Survey, which was uh, conducted uh, in 2015-16, that said that India's unemployment rate is still at 5% in 15-16, compared to 3.8% in 12-13. And only 60% of the workforce manages to get the, the job throughout the year. It means 40% of the people who are said to be employed, they are in fact underemployed. 40% of the workforce, of course, they are said to be employed as per the survey, but they are underemployed. They are not getting a job for the full year. And therefore, along with the unemployment, underemployment is, is the another problem which we are experiencing in the India's economy. India's economy. And therefore, the, the, the unemployment situation is quite different. It's quite different in India. And if you look into the, the, the reasons for the divergence between growth and employment, particularly after the economic reforms, we find various reasons. We can uh, harp upon various reasons which are responsible for the rising unemployment, uh, particularly after economic reforms. 
and the reason we can classify uh, both on the demand side as well as on the supply side. First, I'll take up the factors which are responsible on the, the demand side. On the demand side, you see that as I said, that uh, most of the workforce which is released by the agriculture is to be absorbed in the non agriculture sectors. It is to be absorbed in the non agriculture uh, sectors. But in the non agriculture sector, we also know that the service sector is contributing the major portion of GDP after economy reforms. And service sector is the major driver of the growth process in India. And service sector is contributing 58 or 57 percent of the, of the GDP. But the service sector is not employing commensurately the large uh, people who are released by the agriculture. The service sector is employing only 30, 32 percent of the labor force, despite the fact that they are contributing the around 58 or to 60 percent in the GDP because I'm using these figures because sometimes we use the gross value added sometimes we use the GDP and therefore the figure become different if you use GDP or if you use the GVA but uh, we can say that 57 58 percent of the service contribution uh, is there but they are employing only 30 to 32 percent of the workforce in the service sector one one important point second important point is of course the share of the agriculture sector is continuously falling uh, in the gdp but the agriculture continues to employ the 44 to 45 percent of the workforce uh, meaning thereby that the 44 to 45 percent of the workforce employed in the agriculture is leading to the very low productivity in agriculture 45% producing 15% of the GDP. It means those who are employed in agriculture are having very low productivity. And coming to the service sector again, service sector may be bifurcated into two sectors. One is the organized service sector, other is the unorganized service sector. Organized service sector are like the, the, the financial services sector, insurance sector, IT or IT enable services sector, these are the transportation sector, these are the, the, the organized service sector, organized service sector. These sectors are, are said to be highly capital intensive and skill in intensive. They require the knowledgeable person or skilled workers to work with and their productivity is quite high. Their productivity is quite high. The productivity in the in the organized service sector is five to ten times more than the the productivity prevailing in the other part of the sectors and therefore if this this uh, part of the service sector that is organized service sector expense gdp will be pushed up gdp will rise because it has productivity five to ten times more than the other sector particularly in formal service sector but this service sector being knowledge intensive and capital intensive gives the employment to the very few people and that's why the service sector of course it contributes around half of the service GDP but they are employing only 2% of the people engaged in the service sector 2% of the people engaged in the service sector are employed in the organized knowledge intensive and capital intensive service sector it means the 95 to 98 percent of the people engaged in the service sector are in the informal service sector where productivity is very very low where productivity is very very low that's why even if the the 30 30 or 30 to 32 percent of the people engaged in the service sector the contribution is hardly 58 percent and that is mainly because of the expansion of the organized service sector after the economic reforms because after the economic reform the demand for services have increased significantly and that's why the expansion of these organized service sector which are knowledge intensive and capital intensive contributed significantly to gdp but did not create enough job for the people who are released by agriculture and the person who are released by agriculture being either semi-skilled or unskilled they are absorbed in the informal service sector 
like in the restaurants, in the tourism uh, 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 sector, or in some other small jobs in the in the informal sector. And that's why this a kind of duality, dual sector is created in the within the service sector. And this is the expansion of the organized service sector, which contributed to growth, but did not contribute to the the employment. This is the another important uh, reason for uh, rising the GDP, but not rising commensurate the employment in the economy. The the other reason which is responsible is the productivity growth in the manufacturing. We we as you are aware that after nineteen. 91 when we initiated the industrial policy we tried to open up the economy we opened up the economy by reducing all customs and tariff duties we have opened up the economy by reducing all kinds of control measures in the manufacturing sector and therefore we allowed our manufacturing sector to compete with the rest of the world and therefore indian manufacturer uh, and manufacturing sector has to compete with the with the global manufacturing sector and in the in the global manufacturing sector the demand is rising at the rate of 3 to 4 percent per annum while the productivity in the sector is rising at the rate of 5 to 7 percent per annum it means global manufacturing sector is already having the excess capacity excess capacity and in such a situation they cannot reduce the prices uh, uh, of their product to attract the customers and therefore the only way to sustain in the manufacturing sector by Indian manufacturing sector is to improve their productivity and improving their productivity means they should change their technology so that they become competitive with the rest of the world and therefore most of the manufacturing sector in India are moving towards the highly capital intensive techniques of production that is automation and robotization is the process which they are following as a result as a result the productivity of the manufacturing sector is rising but the employment elasticity is falling they are not generating adequate employment generation because the the place of the labor is taken by the capital and capital is replacing the labor that's why if you, we have seen in the table that uh, after 11-12, the actual number of people employed in the manufacturing has declined. Absolute number has declined and it is declining even thereafter. Therefore, the service sector is not absorbing the people, the manufacturing sector is not absorbing the people, then where the people will go? People will have to survive and they have to get the job and therefore they are largely absorbed in the in the in the informal sector in the informal sector other important reason is uh, is essentially the 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 exports small sectors is obviously uh, is very very important in case of india's economy they are employing around 40% of the workforce and representing 45% of india's manufacturing output and 40% of india's total exports are also coming from the small and medium enterprises but these sector is facing its own problem. They are facing the, the serious, severe problem of access to banking facilities. That's why this sector is not able to expand. On the other hand, the, the export demand of our uh, product remains almost stable for the last five to seven years. It remained around 310, 320 billion dollar when exports are stagnant. And therefore, the, 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 uh, the export output or output in the labor intensive sector is not rising and that's why employment in general is not rising is not rising and that's why the 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 employment generation remains almost stagnant over a period of time if you look at the other uh, uh, side the why the people remains to be small and medium enterprises when they are facing the typical problem of access to banking facilities why not they converted themselves into the large scale industries if they can? The problem which is uh, which is forcing the small and medium and small enterprises to remain small is our the the labor laws, labor laws which were uh, enacted by the parliament 
and in the in the central planned development era where the focus was to protect the laborers from the exploitation of the bureaucracy because public sector enterprises are owned by or uh, owned by the uh, the bureaucrats to exploit to to stop the exploitation of the workers to provide them the better work environment the various labor laws were enacted in 50s and 60s which were favoring the workers which are favoring the workers for example the industrial dispute resolution act trade union act work compensation act the the bonus payment act the various labor laws are there we have 44 labor laws in the central sector and we have around 200 labor laws in the state sector and every entrepreneur who is employing minimum 100 workers in their um, enter in their factory or in their enterprise or in their service um, enterprise they have to comply with they have to comply with the labor laws labor laws and labor laws are as i said they are favoring the people for example under industrial dispute resolution act the 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 management of the company they they have no power to remove any person or they have no power to retrench any labor from the job if they want to retrench somebody and they are employing more than 100 workers they have to seek the permission of the government particular state government they have to seek the permission before retrenching anybody if they retrench without permission the worker may go to the labor court a labor court will give the judgment in the favor of the worker and therefore the worker will get all the compensation from the company therefore the the the, the employers they feel that the the labor laws are are forcing them to remain the small enterprises employing the less than 100 workers and so so that they are not are uh, required to comply with the uh, with the labor laws similarly indian trade union act if you are employing 100 workers then you can you have the workers have the right to form the union and 15 workers can form the one union so there theoretically you can form the 6 to 7 union in a enterprise and therefore no management particularly private sector management would like union to be formed in the in their uh, business organization and that's why they they they, they tend to employ less worker but they want to expand their output and therefore they they try to um, adopt more and more capital intensive technology to replace the labor so that they are not in compliance with the labor laws so therefore the labor laws are also compelling the industries to remain small small and micro enterprises and small and micro enterprises are facing the huge the severe problem of access to banking facilities and therefore they are not able to expand they are not able to expand normally we say that in our indian uh, manufacturing sector or indian service sector either we have a small and micro enterprises or we have a large enterprises middle enterprises is missing from the indian scene sometime question also comes in the exam do you agree with the view that the middle sector is missing from the india's non agricultural sector or indian manufacturing sector so therefore the the small and the micro enterprises are compelled to remain small by the labor law and large scale enterprises um, if they want to become they have to comply with the labor law therefore the the both on the demand and supply side we are having this kind of uh, problem and therefore the 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 government is also giving the tax incentives of the depreciation allowances all are solely linked to the amount of investment made by the enterprise not with the number of jobs created therefore the benefits of tax incentives subsidies depreciation allowances etc are are availed by the large scale enterprises and small scale enterprises are not able to take the full advantage of these benefits and therefore the 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 a kind of the dual system is developed in our the industrial sector other important uh, reasons which we may call it a specific reasons after 2011 12 which led to the 
fall in the employment or stagnation in the employment generation the one uh, important area is the fall in the capital formation gross fixed capital formation is is falling consistently after 11 12 after 11 12 the, the figure which is uh, released by the um, uh, by the cmi or the nsso indicate that in 2007-8 we were having 38.7% gross fixed capital formation that is the capital formation to gdp ratio is 38.7% which is reduced to 29.5% in 17-18 and even today it is around 29.5 or 30% the fall in the gross fixed capital formation means the 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 fall in the rate of growth because rising gross fixed capital formation is directly linked with the gdp growth <clears throat> that's why from 11 12 onwards the rate of growth is not being pushed up is not being pushed up growth of rate has been stable to 4.4.5 or 5% even after revision of the methodology in 2015 growth rate has not picked up is not picked up this is one of the reason for the slower rate of growth after Uh, 2013 14 onwards the other region which is uh, um, um, which is uh, uh, which is revealed by the cmi data cmi e issues the capex index data and they said that the new investment proposals which were coming every year around 25 lakh crores in 11 12 they are reduced to 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 around 10 lakh crores in 18 19 and after the uh, the pandemic it is it has further gone down and therefore the new investment proposals are not coming gross fixed capital formation is falling which led to which led to fall in the in the employment generation in the manufacturing sector particularly and that's why in the manufacturing sector the actual employment generation or or number of people employed in the manufacturing sector had declined from 59 million to 48 million in 15 16 and this is actual fall in the manufacturing job results into rising unemployment in the economy if corresponding jobs are not created in the service and the other sectors as i mentioned the export performance has been very sluggish after 2015 uh, 14 15 until uh, 18 19 or even thereafter when export sector is not expanding it means the the export oriented labor intensive sectors are not expanding as a result the job created in this sector is falling as i gave the data earlier also 11 12 around 9.3 lakhs jobs are created in these eight sectors which are labor intensive but it is declined to around 1 lakh or 1.3 lakhs in 2015 16 onwards it means in these sectors also the number of jobs created is falling is falling the another important reason which has been explained by by many of course uh, it may not be a actual reason but it is only reflection that the the people have established the relationship between rate of inflation and rate of unemployment if rate of inflation is very high the rate of unemployment will be very low in the economy and relationship between rate of inflation and rate of un- rate of unemployment is is shown by the phillips curve and from 19 uh, 2013 14 onwards the rate of uh, growth has been a uh, rate of uh, rate of inflation has been very moderate we are able to control the inflation when inflation has been very low then the rate of unemployment is bound to rise and this is what is reflected by the flips curve also that rate of unemployment which was around the 2.1% in 11 12 increased to 6.1% in 1718 and this is um, also one of the reasons for falling uh, gdp growth rate and rising unemployment so therefore there are various reasons are identified uh, for the <coughs> for the people uh, for for the rising unemployment in the economy for the rising unemployment in the economy and since the people are not able to get the job according to the skills and capabilities they possess the people become disillusioned people become frustrated and therefore 
in such a situation the the youth of the country either it may be maybe may be deviate in some the unsocial activities or they 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 um, they withdraw from the labor market they withdraw from the labor market as uh, as a result of their withdrawal uh, as you have seen in the table that the actual number of people worked is declining actual number of people uh, in the workforce are declining and this is the major trend which has emerged which has emerged over a period of time if you look at on the supply side of the labor force why the people are not able to get the job in the emerging sectors if you look at on the supply side this we we saw that the people lack the skills people lack the skills which are required in the emerging sectors emerging sectors are the organized service sector or organized manufacturing sector and these sector require the highly skilled workers to work in the in their production areas but the kind of labor released by the agriculture and the kind of workforce the or labor force we have they are either semi skilled or unskilled workers the data which is published by nsso for 11 12 you see that the 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 formally uh, the technically trained and educated in, uh, uh, persons are only 2.2% of the workforce 2.2% of the workforce even if we add the those who have got the skills through the hereditary through the self learning or through the learning by doing process the total labor labor force which is set to be skilled in our country is the 7.3% or the maximum you can say 10% the 7 to 10% is the workforce which is skilled is skilled formally or informally both and therefore the the, the with, with 7% or 10% skilled workforce the kind of market we have developed is is obviously the outcome because 7% skilled workers are absorbed in the organized sector remaining 90% who are semi skilled and unskilled they are not absorbed in the organized and knowledge intensive and capital intensive sectors they are absorbed in the less capital intensive or the the sector where they require only semi skilled or unskilled workers that's why the informal sector is expanding over a period of time figure which i have shown in uh, in the previous table that the number of workforce or number of labor force uh, engaged in the informal sector has increased from 90% to 92% in the 10 years period it means the the semi skilled and unskilled workers who are released by agriculture and who are available in the urban areas they are absorbed in the informal sector where the productivity is is around 10 times lower than the productivity in the in the organized sector and this is the kind of sector we have generated and because the informality of the um, um, uh, the employment is rising the kind of work workforce we have you see that the self employed people are 52% of the workforce 52% of the workforce are self employed means they are engaged in their small small uh, the enterprises self employed and 30% are casual workers who are seeking the job on daily basis only 18% are regular employed only 18% are regular employed both in the formal or informal sector and this is the kind of workforce we have produced over a period of time because of their specific characteristics and specific characteristics is the, is that they are not skilled and those who are skilled they do not possess the skill which is required in the market in the employment market in the job market that's why because of mismatch between the two the unemployment is rising and as i said people cannot remain to be unemployed in the india economy because of the low level of per capita income they are largely absorbed in the informal sector and they are ready to work at the lower uh, uh, wage rate or lower income in the informal sector or they start their own 
small establishments to keep themselves self-employed. That's why the more than half of the uh, the labor force is engaged in the in the self-employed jobs, and the 30 percent are seeking jobs on the daily basis. And this is the kind of labor force we have. The, therefore, if you look at the demand and supply side of the labor force, we find that the kind of uh, the employment market or kind of labor market we have is the natural outcome of the demand and supply conditions prevailing in the labor market. Demand and supply conditions prevailing in the labor market. And that's why the challenge before us is how to handle this kind of the employment market. And this is the, the, the challenge for the, the policy makers, how to handle the situation of rising unemployment in the economy or rising the, the, uh, or rising, uh, the unemployment or rising low quality employment in the economy. We have to handle both the situation. And you see that the, the data we have presented here is the NSSO data of 11-12 and the Ministry of Labor data of 1516, where we wanted to establish the relationship between the, the education we are providing to our youth and the unemployment among them. And you see the data indicate that the more educated you are, the more likely that you will remain unemployed. You see that in this in this case, the, the, the graduates and the certificate holders they are, they are around the 9.6% uh, percent are unemployed or certificate holders or diploma holders. Graduates and post-graduates are 19%. Percent, uh, they are unemployed as per the NSSO data. But when we uh, put it along with the Ministry of Labor data, we found that figures are almost comparable. And the, the Ministry of Labor uh, data says that the 26-27% the graduates are unemployed in 1516 and 28% are unemployed the, who are the postgraduates. Therefore, the larger the education you get, more higher education you get, more likely that you will remain unemployed, mainly because the, the, the education you have received by getting the degree is, is do not providing you the skill which is required in the market. And therefore, there is a huge mismatch between the skill you possess and the skill required in the market. That's why the rate of unemployment is very, very high among the educated people. Those who are less qualified or less educated, say illiterate or below primary or primary, rate of unemployment is very low because they are flexible in getting the, the jobs. If they are not getting the jobs of carpentry, they can do the other job of the similar nature and therefore they, they keep themselves employed. Therefore, the rate of unemployment among them is very, very low. But the rate of unemployment among the educated person is quite high. Therefore, we have to tackle the problem of largely educated unemployment in the country. Keeping this fact in view, keeping this fact in view, the in from 1516 onwards, the methodology of calculating the unemployment has been changed by the government. This has been changed in response to the, the IMF uh, uh, Special Data Dissemination Standard. The IMF circulated the Special Data Dissemination Standard for all the countries under which they identified 14 macroeconomic parameters for which they want the quarterly data from all the member countries. And we being the part of the IMF, we also have to provide the data on 14 economic indicators. IMF has identified uh, the quarterly data. But as we have seen that we are not collecting data on employment or unemployment status of the people, uh, on not only quarterly, even annually, we are not collecting. And that's why the, we have to change the methodology. And to comply with the IMF, uh, the guidelines, the government has decided to change the methodology of collecting the data on unemployment and employment status of the people. And therefore, we have changed the system from National Sample Survey Organization data collection to
to the periodical labor force survey and the first periodical labor force survey was conducted uh, for uh, 2017 and 18 and plf is conducted the quarter on quarterly basis in the urban areas and annual basis in the rural areas therefore at least we have the annual data of employment or unemployment both in the rural and urban areas urban urban data is, uh, is available on quarterly basis but rural data is available only on the annual basis but if you want to compare we have to have the same base that is annual therefore we have the annual data of employment unemployment in the rural areas or the in the urban areas that's why the plfs is new system was introduced but plfs system is different from the erstwhile the nsso survey nsso was collecting the data based on the sample which Uh, which uses the expenditure pattern of the people uh, in selection of the household expenditure pattern of the people or the per capita income of the people was the 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 criteria on which the household was selected from which the data is being collected on their employment or on unemployment status but in the plfs we have changed the the base now we have uh, we have uh, introduced the education as the selection criteria and we have selected uh, those families both in the rural and urban areas which have some people in the family uh, which are educated which are educated for example in rural areas we we, we start collecting data uh, from the families where in at least two or more members are 10th standard and above qualified they have at least educated up to 10th standard 25% of the families in the rural areas are selected for collecting the employment status where the two or more members are educated at least up to 10th standard then where only one member is, is educated up to 10th standard 50% beta is given to those families and 25% beta is given to those families where no one is is educated even up to 10th standard and therefore in the rural areas we 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 uh, pick up the household based on this criteria similarly in case of the urban areas we gave the weightage uh, to the families where the the one or more members are educated up to 10th standard and where the three or more members are up to 10th standard educated we give 25% weightage where two or more members are educated we give 25% weightage one or more more members where the uh, person is educated up to 10th standard we get 25% weightage and where no member is educated up to 10th standard we give 25% weightage equal weightage is given to all the four categories in case of rural areas we have uh, uh, we have only classified in three categories that is two or more member one member and no member educated up to 10th standard and therefore the selection of household Uh, the basis has been changed earlier basis was the 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 expenditure pattern of the the top um, households middle level households and the and the bottom level households but now we have changed the the criteria and we have given the education as a as a as, as a mandatory uh, support criterion and so that we can find out how many educated uh, people are unemployed in the country because the as, as we have seen that as you have become more and more educated it is more likely that you, you will become the you will remain unemployed that's why we have given the education as a as a basis for selection of the households in the sample and once the 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 samples are collected based on this criteria we have a uh, the data over a period of time first i picked up the the first survey which was conducted in 1718 so 1718 and if you you conduct the 1718 plf data we found that the the rate, rate of unemployment has increased to 6.1% nothing has been changed but the we have only picked up the households based on certain education standards and therefore the rate of unemployment has increased rate of unemployment has increased 
from 2.7 percent in 11, 12, 3.7 percent in 15, 16, and 6.1 percent in 17, 18. Of course, they are not comparable because the the basis of selection in these two uh, uh, surveys are different, and basis of selection in these PLF is different. But even if the basis is different, you see the the moment you add education as the mandatory criteria for selection of the household, the rate of unemployment increases. Rate of unemployment increases. And if you look at the, the specific rate of unemployment among the youth, 15 to 29 years, we find that in 1718, the 19.2% is the rate of unemployment among the youth, 15 to 29 years. These are the, this is the age group in, uh, in which the, the youth is either engaged in the uh, in getting the higher education or getting some training or doing some job and the rate of unemployment has been 19.2 percent if you apply the nssu survey this is 10.3 percent the jump jump is the nine percentage point and that's why it, it it reveals that the plfs survey is indicating high rates of unemployment because now we are focusing on the unemployment among the educated persons, educated persons. That's why the PLFS data is not directly comparable with the previous NSSO data. But we have compared because the first PLFS survey was conducted in 1718. Thereafter, we have conducted the PLFS survey every year. Every year we have conducted the PLFS survey. And based on the, so far we have conducted the five surveys, PLFS. I'll show you the trend among the, uh, among the uh, trend in the unemployment, among the various categories of the people as per the PLFS uh, solely. So that we can find out even if PLFS is introduced, the conclusion has not changed much. Conclusion has not changed much, but this table is also uh, very important to understand because this table reveals certain important features. You see that in this table, the most important line is the youth not in the labor force, education, training or somewhere. It means those youth who are not getting education, not getting uh, training, not employed anywhere, but also not seeking jobs in the labor force market and their number is increasing. Their number is consistently increasing. In two, four, five, there were 70 million people. In 11, 12, 84 and in 17, 18, it increased to the 100 million, 10 crore. 10 crore people are, are withdrawing from the labor market. They are neither uh, getting higher education nor getting training anywhere, not employed anywhere, but they are withdrawn. They are withdrawn from the labor market and they are disillusioned, frustrated people who withdrawn from the labor market because they are not getting the job commensurate to the degrees or skill they are possessing. And this is the, this is the most important uh, figure. If we adjust this figure with the workforce, then our unemployment rate might jump to 40 to 50 percent. So far, we are including them as a as a part of the labor force, but they have already withdrawn. The one of the figure released by the the NSSO survey as well as PLFS is the youth, which is not in the labor force, not in education, not in training anywhere. Therefore, if we adjust this figure in the in the labor force, the rate of unemployment will jump jump to the 40 to 50 percent. This is why this, this figure is very, very important. Now, <clears throat> keeping this in view, if you look at the trends which are prevailing as per the, as per the, the PLFS survey, you see that here we are comparing the PLFS survey of 1819 with 1718 and 1112. You see that in this PLFS survey, we have taken the labor force participation rate workforce participation rate and the unemployment rate and the unemployment rate and you see that I am focusing on the unemployment rate. You see that workforce participation rate 
which was around uh, 37% in 1718, was almost the same in the 1819. And the, this remains almost stagnant. This remains almost stagnant. You see that in this in this case, it was 37%. Uh, here it is 30, again 37%. And this is the aggregate, the, again 37% around. This, is, this remains the same. This remains the same. Warford population rate also remains the same in, in the one year. Nothing has changed. Nothing has changed. But the unemployment, which was 6.1% in 1718, is marginally declined to 5.8% in 1819. This is the PLF survey. This is for all ages. This is for all ages using the <coughs> the uh, the all ages figures. If you look at the uh, the youth figures, the, among the youth, among the youth, you find that the rate of unemployment has not changed; it's marginally declined from 17.8 percent to the 17.4 percent. The last figure, the last figure, you see that last figure in this table. <coughs> in the last figure in this table, the this is last figure 17.8 percent. And 17.4 percent the rate of unemployment is still quite high according to plfs survey of course according to nss survey it is very low but according to plfs survey it is quite high because we are focusing on the educated unemployed people educated and unemployed people and if we compare the other surveys which has come that is 1920 2021 and 21-22. If you look at these uh, uh, surveys which are available with us, there is another, another, another three surveys, another three PLFS surveys. You see that the labor force participation rate has increased. You see that in the, this in this figure, 1920, it has increased to 53.5. Labor force participation rate, work participation rate increased to around 51%. In, in 2021, it is increased to 54.9, 52.6 because after pandemic, the situation has likely improved. And again, it has uh, slightly improved in 21-22. An improvement in the labor force participation rate and work participation rate led to fall in the rate of unemployment, rate of unemployment. And you see that the using the usual status approach, during these three surveys, we find the rate of unemployment was 4.8% in 1920, reduced to 4.2% in 2021, and further to 4.1% in 2122. The PLFS surveys are showing the declining unemployment rate among the, among the, uh, using the usual status for the all ages, for the all ages. Taking into account the weekly status, again the trend is the same. Of course, rate of unemployment is quite high, 8.8%, 7.5%, and 6.6%. But the trend is declining. Trend is declining because the labor force participation rate and work participation rate is increasing, increasing over a period of time, which led to fall in the the unemployment rate. If you if you look at the the <coughs> Uh, the usual status rate for uh, the the January 22 to December 22, it is further declined from 4.2 to 3.6 percent because the labor force participation rate has slightly improved, has slightly improved. Therefore, the the indication which the the these surveys are giving is that over a period of time, the rate of unemployment is is falling. A rate of unemployment is is falling over a period of time and this is the trend which we can see in terms of the graph you can remember this graph therefore this this graph indicates the annual employment rate annual employment rate among the urban areas and among the rural areas and the average the you see that urban areas it was 7.8% in 1718 which reduced to 6.3% in 2122 and in the rural areas, it reduced from 5.3% to 3.2%. And average is 6.1% to 4.1% till 11-12, uh, till 21-22. It means 
it has improved because of the labor force participation rate has improved. Labor force participation rate has improved because the government claims that more employment opportunities are generated in the economy. As a result, more and more people are participating in the labor force and the labor market. They are getting the jobs and therefore the rate of unemployment is falling. The rate of unemployment is falling. This is, if you take the, uh, the quarterly data, you find the same kind of conclusion. The, but this is the, the trend which has emerged using the PLFS data. PLFS data is the data released by the government based on their annual and quarterly surveys. But if you use the CMI e-data, CMI e-data which is uh, available all for all the years but we are concentrating on the current year 22-23. In 22-23, the, the CMI data, as I said in the beginning, the CMI is releasing the monthly data and you see that monthly data if you look at the uh, the trend in the unemployment in 22-23 it remains almost stagnant almost is the, the, the six to eight percent is the range during the year and on average it was 7.6 percent it was 7.6 percent while the government is claiming it is to be around four percent this is as i said because of change in the methodology the government is collecting the data based on their own methodology. CMI is collecting data on annual, uh, on monthly basis using their own methodology. Their methodology is different. That's why the data is different. That's why I, I said in the beginning that as far as employment is concerned, we have to use the data very carefully. Sometimes we read in the newspaper, somebody is writing a critical analysis of unemployment but uh, the using what kind of data if he's writing using the cmi data then we have to indicate based on the cmi data this is the conclusion but if you are using the plfs data we have to indicate very clearly that the the using the plfs data this is the trend so i have shown you the trend which is uh, based on the plfs data and the current year data using the the cmi data so therefore, uh, as I said that the, the using the CMI data, if you look at the uh, unemployment among the educated level, we find that it is very high. It is very quite high and rising consistently after 11, 12. Uh, rising consistently after 11, 12, the uh, unemployment among the educated youth is rising. But again, uh, here we have to qualify that this is based on the CMI data. But the the trend is, is really similar to the data as released by the PLFS. But the only extent of the unemployment is different. They are projecting 17-18% and CMI is projecting around 30% unemployment rate among the, the educated people. Only difference is that otherwise the, the common conclusion is that rate of unemployment among the educated person is very, very high is very very high and therefore the the question is what kind of policy we have to uh, look at what kind of policy we have to look at and simultaneously to support the argument of the high educated unemployment the world economic forum also recently released a data and the world economic forum report says that that among the youth uh, in the age group 15 to 29, the rate of unemployment is, is quite high and it is in double digit unemployment, uh, not only uh, in all these states, without any exception, all these states are having the high rate of unemployment among the youth 15 to 29. And this is highest in the, in the Haryana, followed by Rajasthan, then by JNK and the other states. And therefore, the rate of unemployment is quite high among the educated youth. And World Economic Forum also released a data which says that every year in Indian labor market, 13 million people are added. 13 million, 1.3 crore people are added to the labor market every year. Every year. And therefore, we have to secure the employment for these 1.3 crore people and those who are in the backlog already. 
So we have to generate the at least three to four crore employment opportunities every year to absorb the backlog as well as those who have recently joined. But the problem remains the same, that the, the job opportunities are still there, but the people who are seeking employment, they are not possessing the skills which is required in the market. And that's why the, the World Economic Forum uh, reached to the conclusion that the, the 13 million people who are joining workforce every year, they, they found that the every one person in the four management professionals and one person in engineers and five engineers and the 10 graduates and one in 10 graduates are not employable, are not employable. It means only 24, 25% among the management professionals, 20% among the engineers and only 10% among the graduates are employable in the market. It means the, the, the rest of the people who are possessing the degree, but they are not employable in the market. As a result, they remain unemployed and they are adding, adding to the stock of the people who are unemployed in the economy. And this is mainly because of the mismatch between the skills required in the market and the skill possessed by these educated people. Unless these two mesh together, we cannot solve the problem of the, the unemployment in the economy. And the, the kind of education system we have developed, we are still providing the, the education to the students, which is, which is not of much use in creating skills in them, which are actually required in the market for getting the job. And that's why the, the problem in India remains that uh, we are unable to provide the skills to the youth which are required in the near future. That is, we have to provide the skills to the people which involve technology such as the, the, the artificial intelligence, machine learning, big data analysis, web development. These are the areas where the most of the, the employment opportunities are being generated. And if we are not able to provide these kind of training to the youth, they will uh, definitely remain the unemployed in the market. And since they cannot remain to be unemployed for a very long period, and therefore are out of frustration and disillusionment, they either withdraw from the labor market or they join the, the informal sector, uh, which is uh, at the lower wage rate or lower, lower salary, which is not commensurate to the degree they are possessing. And therefore, the mismatch between the degree uh, they possess and the skills required in the market is mainly responsible for rising unemployment in the, uh, among the educated youth. And the CMI data uh, releases, which were released in November, December last time, in the last year, they said that the jobless numbers in the market are touching the five crore people. Five crore people, that is 50 million people, are the unemployed in the economy. Now, based on their uh, the monthly survey, when they, uh, they 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 combine the monthly survey and uh, bring out the annual data, uh, it is found that the 19, 20, 21, 22, you see that in all the four years, the labor force participation rate has not changed significantly has not changed significantly. That is, in, in 2019, the 44.2 crore people were there in the labor force market. They have the, in the, as for the CMI data, the number of employed persons in the country as of November 22 was 40.18 crore. And three years before, in November 19, there were 40.3 crore, not different, not different in three years. It means the number of jobs created has not changed much. This is also indicated in the form of the labor force participation rate. You see that in November it was 40.43.7 and in, in the three years back it was 44.2. Not much change was there in the labor force participation rate. 
as a result the number of employment is rising every year because every year we are adding 1.3 crore people in the labor force market only in the pandemic year it was slightly declined it was slightly declined labor force participation rate is slightly declined and therefore only 39.4 people were employed because of pandemic but it is further increased to 40.27 crores in the 21 therefore if you if you see the trend from november 19 till the november 22 the number of people employed remains almost stable it means the jobs are stagnant new no new jobs are created and with the stagnation job if the number of people added in the labor markets are increasing every year then obviously the the a stock of unemployment is rising the people who remains unemployed is rising every year and in november uh, 22 cmie estimated that around 5 crore people remains unemployed in the economy and keeping this uh, in view that the unemployment is quite high the government um, in june 22 they have uh, promised that the 10 lakh vacancies which are lying vacant in the government they are going to fill up in the in the in the next 18 months in the next 18 months therefore government has taken the initiative that they are going to fill up this 10 lakh vacancies which will generate the employment opportunities for educated youth and therefore the the prime minister has said that process is, is already started and in october he had he has delivered 75000 appointment letters in the in the various rozgar melas and therefore he said that the process has already began and the further investment in the infrastructure projects and further policies of the governments um, which has helped in creating the jobs will be able to reduce the unemployment rate over a period of time and this is what the government is trying to uh, bring and therefore the the based on the plfs data again the government in one of the uh, response to the parliament question has claimed that the number of graduates uh, unemployment is is consistently falling from the 1920 onwards and in 1920 it was 17.2% which is gradually reduced to 14.9% in 2122 and government is cl- claiming that they are implementing various policies like national career service scheme under which they are guiding the uh, youth regarding the job search re- regarding matching their skills with the uh, skills required in the market providing them vocational guidance and the other information on the skill development We, they have started the uh, national career service under which the counseling is provided to the youth in the new education policy announced uh, in 2020 we are trying to integrate the skill development programs with the normal education so that people from the young age is getting some skills to uh, to acquire which will help them in getting the job uh, when they uh, enter into the labor market the scheme for higher education uh, youth in apprenticeship and skills sireas This is the scheme announced by the government, under which those who are normal graduates, they were given some apprentice training in various uh, enterprises, so that they can acquire some skills and get the job in the respective areas. Similarly, the the Ministry of Skill Development and Entrepreneurship is implementing national apprenticeship promotion scheme, under which the 25 percent of the of the wages paid to the apprentice uh, uh, apprentice who are coming uh, the graduate who are coming for apprenticeship is borne by the government and government is also implementing various schemes under pradhan mantri koshal vikas yojana to upgrade the skills of the people skills skills of the people in the rural areas government has opened various the the skill development centers and through through these centers the government is trying to reach to the rural youth both boys and girls to upgrade their skills so therefore government is is claiming that 
they are putting in place various policies which will help in generating the requisite skills among the youth so that they can enter into the labor market and get the jobs and get the jobs and this will help in reducing the the unemployment among the youth the one of the important scheme which government is is implemented through which they it is claimed that around 6 million jobs will be created in next 5 years that is the pli scheme that is protection lung linked incentive scheme is being implemented by the government and in uh, in the un budget 2324 it is claimed that this scheme will generate at least these 6 million jobs in the next 5 years in next 5 years pli scheme is implemented in 14 uh, manufacturing sectors which include all modern manufacturing sector it hardware manufacturing semiconductors oil electricity uh, manufacturing gadgets all sectors are included in this 14 list of 14 manufacturing where the government is giving incentives in these sectors if they if they increase the output beyond the 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 target level set uh, for them taking into account the base year the target is set for them to increase their output if they cross the target they are given the cash incentive by the government under pli scheme what incentive they are giving i am not entering into that but what i am saying here is that if the pli sectors are enlarging their output obviously it will lead to generation of employment it will lead to generation of employment and the 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 it is estimated that the the pli sectors will add the 30 lakh crores additional output in their respective areas and if so much output is generated it will certainly lead to generation of employment in the manufacturing sector which will attract the the skilled workers which will attract the skilled workers to uh, for the employment so therefore the the point here is uh, is important that the in the in the manufacturing sector and the in the organized service sector we have to provide adequate incentives so that more and more jobs are created so therefore on the demand side the employment generation is uh, is important but at the same time the on the supply side those who are seeking jobs in the labor market they have to be adequately equipped by providing them the requisite skills so that the they can match their skills with the skills required on a particular job and unless this matching is done it is very difficult to address the problem of educated unemployment in the system and that's why this chapter this topic has become very very important this topic has become very very important and therefore the challenge challenge before the the government or policy making is that of course the structure of the uh, india's economy is changing but the change in the structure is very very slow as i said that the 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 agriculture of course its share in the gdp is declining very fast and today it is contributing only 15% of the gdp but they are still employing around 44 45% of the workforce unless the the employment in agriculture is reduced commensurate to their contribution to gdp that is it should not employ more than 10 to 15% of the workforce only then the productivity in agriculture will rise unless we have reached that stage we will not be able to 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 develop the agriculture sector but if the agriculture releases so much workforce then it has to be absorbed in the non agriculture sector and as i said that in non agriculture sector we have organized manufacturing organized services sector on the one hand on the other hand we have a unorganized or informal manufacturing and the other uh, sectors and the informal service sector therefore the as long as the informal sector is expanding 
the whatever labor force is released by agriculture in the form of semi-skilled and unskilled workers, they will be absorbed in the informal sector. And informal sector will keep expanding very fast, will keep expanding very, very fast. And that's why the productivity in the informal sector is quite low. And the structure of the employment will remain almost unchanged. That is, the self-employment remain the major source of employment. And casual workers will still remain in a very high percentage. It's, it is still 30, 28 to 30 percent are the workers who are seeking jobs on daily basis. So therefore, the, the regular workers, their share is either falling or remain stagnant. Even among the regular workers, the, the proportion of the regular workers who are on the contractual basis and proportion of the regular workers who are not giving any contract, written contract, is rising. Is rising. It means informality, even among the regular workers, is rising. Informality among the regular workers is also rising. And therefore, we have to arrest these trends. We have to arrest these trends. This is the major challenge before the policy making that the agriculture has to be improved and agriculture has to release a lot of workforce from uh, uh, itself. But this the workforce released have to be absorbed in the non agricultural sector. And unless we improve the non agricultural sector in a more productive way, that is, unless we expand organized manufacturing, organized services sector, uh, we cannot generate the the remunerative employment opportunities. And therefore, people will keep engaged in the informal sector. And informality or informalization of the employment is rising even today in the India's economy. And this is a major challenge. Not only we have to generate the employment, but we have to generate the qualitative employment opportunities so that people get the decent job or the 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 the, the better jobs as and we say in the SDG number eight. SDG eight says that the growth has to be accompanied with the job creation and job creation should be decent, that people should get decent work. And for that to happen, we have to make uh, face the challenge. We have to address the challenge of informalization of the employment in the India economy. That is the major issue we have in this sector. I hope uh, I am able to give you the uh, enough information as far as the unemployment is concerned. I hope that if you get any question in the prelim, uh, in, in the form of alternatives, you will be able to uh, identify the correct alternative if this all information, if you have in your mind. Because unless we have the information, it is very difficult to identify which are the correct uh, alternatives given in the question. So only only way out to, uh, to, to identify the correct alternative is to read as much as you can in a particular topic. And in, in my presentations to you, I'm trying to give you as much information as possible. We are not giving this information so that you start writing the answer, because that is for means. For prelims, the more information you have, the more uh, uh, equipment, more you will become equipped to identify the correct alternative among the given alternatives in a particular question. That's why my objective is to provide you as much information as possible on the particular topic. I hope this will help you in addressing most of the questions relating to unemployment. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.